everybody. Good morning. How you doing today? Good. Get your Bibles out and turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the great book of Philippians. If you don't have a Bible, fire up your iPhone, your iPad, and go to this wonderful book of Philippians. We're going to continue today in this series that we've been in for a few weeks now called Advancing the Gospel with Joy. And what we've seen week after week, that it is possible to live with joy even during times of uncertainty, uh, times of difficulty. Uh, We can have joy when life is unfair. Uh, We can live in joy when it's unfavorable. We can live with the Lord's joy. Uh, Every so often in life, we find ourselves in what we would call uh, a win-win situation. A win-win situation. That is, no matter how things turn out, whatever decision is made, it's going to be a win. We're going to come out ahead. Uh, Christy recently said to me, uh, honey, I'm thinking about making either chicken marbella for dinner. That's one of my favorites. Uh, Chicken marbella, or I'm thinking about a big crock pot of that spicy chili. And I can remember, I just nodded my head, but on the inside, I thought to myself, it's a win-win. It's a win-win. No matter what she decides, it's going to be a big win, and I'm going to come out ahead. Now, uh, maybe you have a fun weekend planned with one of your girlfriends who likes adventure. And you think to yourself, you know, if the weather is good, we're going to go up to Breckenridge, do a little bit of uh, uh, skiing, hang out up there. But if the weather's really nasty and we don't want to fight the traffic on Highway 70, uh, we're going to go ahead and go down to Santa Fe for the weekend. Uh, three days with your bestie, either up in Breck or Santa Fe. And you think to yourself, you know, it's a win-win situation. Uh, no matter what happens, I'm going to come out ahead. Or imagine with me for a moment that you receive an email uh, from your kids. They're trying to decide between spending the money to fly them and the grandkids out to Colorado for spring break, or they say, you know, maybe we'll fly you out to Florida so that you can spend a few days with us here and with the grandkids and we'll go to Disney World together. And you think to yourself, you know, all right. Uh, This is going to be good. No matter what decision is made, no matter how it turns out, it's going to be a win-win. I'm going to be ahead. Now, it's great when we can have a win-win situation in life, that no matter which way it goes, we end up ahead. As we come to Philippians chapter 1, uh, verses 18 through 26, The Apostle Paul finds himself in what we would call a win-win situation. And no matter which way it goes, he's going to come out ahead. As he explained to his friends in Philippi, he said, a few months from now, I'm going to stand before Caesar. Okay, I'm going to go on trial before the Roman emperor, and he's going to make a decision. He's either going to let me live or he's going to let me die. And no matter what he decides, I'm going to come out ahead. It's going to be a win-win situation because either one would be great. Now, when we hear that, we think, whoa, Uh, wait a minute. That doesn't sound to me like the definition of a win-win situation. That sounds to me like a win-lose situation because I think one of those scenarios would be highly preferable to the other. Uh, The very last thing in the world that we would want to do is to stand before Caesar give a defense, and then have Caesar say, off with his head, that your head is gone, right? That doesn't seem like a win-win situation. Uh, What is it about Paul that allowed him to say, whether I live or die, that's a win-win? How so? How so? Well, Paul would reply, because I'm going to get a reward for doing something, and then whatever Caesar decides to do with me is going to be great. I'm going to get God's final stamp of approval on my life, so whatever Caesar decides is going to be a win-win situation for me. Now question, what is Paul about to do for which he expects to receive a reward? Uh, Some validation from God. And how can Caesar's decision, live or die, be a win-win for Paul? Uh, What in the world would make a person say, you know, I could live or I could die. I could really take either one. 
And it's going to be a win-win situation. Now, the answer to those questions is found in Philippians 1.18 through 26. Let's take a look at that together. I invite you, if you're able, to stand for the reading of our Father's Word. Now, this is the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says halfway through verse 18, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. You can be seated. So look at verse 18 carefully. Halfway through verse 18, Paul says... Uh, In the larger context here, in addition to the palace guards meeting Jesus, in addition to the fact that pastors in Rome are now preaching the gospel more boldly because of my imprisonment, that's the context. Now, in verse 18, he says, I have yet another reason to rejoice. Because what's happening to me is also going to bring a great reward. Look carefully at verse 18. He says, yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance. Uh, The word Paul uses for deliverance is the word in his language for salvation. Okay, deliverance carries with it the idea of salvation. Paul is saying what's happening to me is leading toward that great day in heaven where God will put his final stamp of approval over my life. When he will finish my salvation. Paul is looking forward to that day when his salvation will be complete. Now a little theology lesson here. When the Bible speaks about salvation, it uses salvation in three different ways. Okay, we have our past salvation, we have a present salvation, and we have a future salvation. The Bible speaks about our past salvation as that time when we put our full faith and confidence in the Lord Jesus, believing that he died for our sins on the cross and that he was buried and he was raised from the dead, that he paid the penalty, that he took the punishment that you deserve and I deserve and he was raised from the dead three days later. We were saved forever from hell and we were given eternal life. That's the past aspect of our salvation. But the Bible also speaks of a present salvation, meaning that we are being saved right now from what? From the power of sin and the hatred of Satan. We're being saved right now from the consequences of misery and emptiness and futility, and instead we find ourselves living joyfully, confidently, expectantly. So we have a past salvation, we have a present salvation, we also have a future salvation. Okay, that time when we will finally and forever be with the Lord Jesus. And at that time we are saved forever from the presence of sin. We are separated from the presence of sin. There will be no more pain, no more mourning, crying, tears, but only the joyful presence of of the Lord, smiling and loving and celebrating and being in the presence of our loved ones who have gone on before us in Jesus. So past salvation, present salvation, and a future salvation. Here Paul is looking toward that future day of deliverance when God will reward him and bless him and give that final stamp of approval, that final salvation over his life. 
when he says, this will turn out for my deliverance, for my salvation, what he means is God is going to put that final stamp of approval over my life, and it's going to contribute greatly to my reward in heaven. In other words, Paul is rejoicing even while in chains, even while waiting to stand before Caesar. (coughs) Yes, he's under house arrest, but he's expecting to receive a great reward for something that he's about to do. That way, whatever Caesar decides to do with him, either live or die, it's going to be a win-win situation. Now, question, what is Paul going to do that's going to bring him a great reward? Answer, he's going to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ before the emperor, before the emperor of Rome, okay, the most powerful man, humanly speaking, in the world at that time. In verses 19 and 20, Paul explains that he's going to have an unbelievable opportunity to magnify Jesus before the most powerful man in the world, the Roman emperor. He's going to honor the Lord before the whole world. He's going to exalt Jesus Christ in a spectacular way. When Paul says, look at it in your Bible at verse 20, when he says, it's my eager expectation and hope, He's actually making up a word in his own language. He's taking three words, he's stringing them together to come up with a new word. A brand new word, all of his own. He says, my head away looking. In other words, I'm turning my head away from everything else and I'm intently focusing on what lies ahead. I'm going to stand before Caesar and I fully anticipate that I'm going to come through this with flying colors, because I'm going to present a strong, bold, courageous case before Caesar, and I'm not going to wimp out, he says. That's my expectation. Look again at verse 20. He says, my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed. Paul says, hey, I'm not going to come out of there beaten down, a bested, feeling like a cowardly loser, but rather through your prayers. In verse 19, and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, through your prayers and through the help of the Holy Spirit, verse 20, I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. Paul knows that this trial before Caesar will give him a great opportunity to magnify Jesus. And Paul is not someone who walks around with a little tiny picture of Jesus in his wallet. And you know, if you ask Paul about Jesus, he might pull out his wallet and show you a picture of Jesus. You know, this little tiny faded picture. Okay, he's not going to say, yeah, you know, I think I have a picture of Jesus somewhere. You know, here it is. You know, sorry, I know it's small. I know it's a bit old. I know Paul is the type of guy that has this life-size billboard of Jesus that he carries with him all the time, everywhere he goes. It's so big that you can hardly see Paul standing behind it. Okay, his whole life is Jesus. He's a slave of Jesus. Jesus died for Paul. Jesus chose Paul. Jesus forgave Paul. Jesus enlisted Paul in the ministry Jesus called Paul to an eternal future. Jesus was his perfect model. Jesus was Paul's passion. Jesus was his Lord. I mean, to ask such a man about Jesus, you don't have to ask much because he's talking about Jesus. He's not the type of guy that you have to say, you know, can I see a picture of Jesus? Because his whole life has become a billboard for Jesus. Everywhere he goes, he talks about Jesus. And now Paul has an opportunity to display Jesus before the emperor of Rome. I mean, that's like in in baseball, that's like taking a ball and putting it on a tee and giving somebody a big bat. Okay, Paul's going to swing for the fence. And Paul says, after I display Christ to Caesar, whatever happens to this body of mine is fine. Uh, Whether this trial ends in life or death for me, it's going to be a win-win. If Caesar releases me, I'm going to go on and I'm going to keep serving Christ. 
I'm going to do what I always do. But if Caesar puts me to death, then great, I finally get to be with Jesus. Now look at verse 21. Here it is, a statement of this classic win-win situation. This is the very heart and the center of this passage. Uh, You know it. You probably have it on a Bible cover. You probably have it on your refrigerator. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Either way, Paul says, I'm going to come out ahead. Okay, it's going to be a win-win. In the following verses, Paul says that it's such a win-win scenario that he's having a hard time choosing between the two. But if you press him, he would rather depart and go be with Christ. I mean, what could be better than that? Uh, Nothing. Nothing. On the other hand, the question is, what would serve God's purposes more? Uh, Probably staying here and serving the churches in Philippi and the other churches uh, in the ancient world a little bit longer. And as Paul thinks about it, He's pretty sure that God is going to allow him to stay a little bit longer, which means Caesar will release him, and he's going to get to see his friends once again. But he says, hey, either way, it's a win-win. Because for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Pastor Kent Hughes, a pastor in the Chicago area, tells the story of his friend and fellow elder, uh, Dr. Andrew Chong. Uh, Dr. Chong was a prominent specialist there in Chicago, and uh, Dr. Chong had a blockage in his heart because of a stent. And he was brought into surgery. The procedure was very invasive. It didn't go well, and Dr. Andrew Chong began bleeding on the operating table, and despite heroic efforts, they could not stop the bleeding. And so the doctors came out to his family in the waiting room and said that we can't can't go on. We can't go on. He's bleeding badly. We can't get the bleeding to stop, and chances are he's not going to make it through the night. So all the children and the grandchildren were rushed to Andrew's bedside where they said their final goodbyes. They were gathered together, they were weeping, saying their final goodbyes, and just then Andrew's starting to come out of the anesthesia, and he was in intense pain, uh, unable to speak, and he wakes up and he sees his family's distress all around him, and he starts motioning with his hand, and after a while they figured out that he was motioning that he wanted a pen. Of late he had been able to unable to write anything in a straight line. But now very slowly, with intense concentration, he wrote 12 words in a column. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And then he anchored all of those words with a foundational word, With great deliberation, it took him nearly a minute to write out these words. He said, hallelujah. And then mustering his last measure of strength, he said three words to his family twice. He said, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. And Dr. Andrew Chong died that night. And these were his last words, his last will and testament. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now question, how in the world do you get to the point in life where you can say, like the Apostle Paul, where you can say, like Dr. Andrew Chong, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I'm just as happy to die, Lord, as I am to stay here on this earth and serve your purposes. How do you get to that point in life where you can wholeheartedly say, for me to live is Christ? I think many of us have that, but it's the other part, and to die is gain. How do you get to that point? You know, I shared with you all a little bit of my health struggles toward the end of last year. 
Uh, you know, they've cleared up now, and I'm very thankful to God that I have a clean bill of health, but there are some pretty scary days there for a while. And you know, as I was talking with the Lord through that whole thing, uh, I realized that in my life, I have not come to that point where I can say, uh, life or death, either one is fine with me. Okay, either one is fine. My response was, Lord, I'm glad that I'm coming to see you someday, but not quite yet. Okay, I'm, I'm not ready to go. I want to see my boys grow up, and I want to be able to hold my wife's hand a little bit longer and keep going on those evening walks we take together to die and be with you. That's a great thing, and I'm glad that that's going to happen someday, but I'd like a little bit more time. Yeah, the first part of it, for me to live is Christ. Uh, agreed, but to die is gain. Lord, I'm not there yet. How did Paul get to that point in his life where he could say, Life or death, it's a win-win situation for me. Well, I think Paul saw a clear picture of what death is, and it made him willing for it to happen. Now, the last four, four and a half years for the Apostle Paul have been some very difficult years. He's been under arrest for four years now, and death, he realizes, for a believer is a going home, a laying down of the heavy burdens of this life. He understood what death really means for a follower of Jesus and recognized that, hey, it would be great. You see that in his understanding of death by a word he uses for it in verse 23. Look at it carefully. You see those words, depart, to depart? He says, I'm hard-pressed between the two. Stay or go. But my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Now, Paul uses this word depart here. It's a word that is also used in other places in the ancient world to describe breaking down a camp. You know, you've been camping for some days and you decide it's time to break camp and it's time to move on. It's also used to describe uh, loosening a ship from its moor lines that tie it to the dock so that it can sail off on a new destination. Now, since most of us don't do much sailing here, I would imagine, uh, let's think about breaking camp for a minute. You've been camping for about a week. Okay, you're looking forward to a hot shower. You've had enough of the mosquitoes, enough of the cold showers, enough bears poking around, enough of the raccoons poking around at night. Uh, enough freezing nights, and you just come to a point about a weekend where you say, you know, enough of this. I'm ready to depart. I'm ready to head home where there's a soft, warm bed waiting for me. There's going to be a good meal, and I'm going to have a nice, hot shower. That would be so much better. Or imagine with me for a moment you've been traveling overseas for about a month, uh, living out of a suitcase, going from one dirty hotel to another, uh, the beds you've been sleeping in are really uncomfortable, and you wonder to yourself, are these sheets really clean, or did they just turn them inside out after the last guest, right? And you know, you have a kink in your neck every morning when you wake up because it isn't your special pillow. Uh, the pillows don't feel right. The air conditioner is broken, but you know, why bother going down to the night clerk because they don't speak English anyways? Uh, when you do leave your hotel, what do you have? You have street signs all over that are in a foreign language. Uh, you're on edge all the time because you're afraid you're going to eat something or drink something that's going to make you sick. Uh, you're on edge because you're afraid somebody might lift your passport or pickpocket your wallet out of your back pocket, and you're just living on edge all the time. And after nearly a month of this, you're frazzled. You're worn out, and you're wearied. You come into the airport. Finally, the time has come to depart. And you come into the airport, and you take a look at that big sign that has all the arrivals and the departures, and you take a look, and you find your flight number, and what do you see? Delayed. Delayed. Or worse yet, canceled. Canceled. What do you say to yourself? You say, I, I just want to go home. Right, I want to go home. I want to depart and go home. 
I think that's how Paul saw it. I want to depart and I, I want to be with Christ. I want to lay down my heavy burdens and I want to go home. When you know how good it's going to be, who wouldn't want to go? Who wouldn't want to go? Now, Paul had no divine word from the Lord that he was going to stay uh, longer, but given his apostolic calling and the need for his ministry uh, to the Philippians, he felt sure that there was more life ahead of him. All right, look at verse 25. He says, convinced of this, I'm convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in you, uh, excuse me, so that in me you may have ample cause of glory in Jesus Christ because of my coming to you again. You see, for many of us in this room, God has been graciously working by his spirit in our lives, bringing us to the point where we can say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, We're ready. Uh, Some of us are are ready. We may even long to go. Uh, We're tired of delay, and some of us would even like to get the show on the road because to be with Christ in glory is far better. But you're here. And God has you here. And maybe some of you are even wondering why. Why does he want you to remain? Well, uh, Paul remained. And what was Paul's attitude and outlook? Paul said, I'm remaining because there's more fruitful service and ministry to be done for the gospel. Uh, Maybe your strength is spent and you're at the end of your life and you think, you know, what can I do? What can I really do? Physically, I'm limited. Well, you can pray, can't you? Use this season of life to grow deeper in prayer and to make your life ministry one of primarily praying. I think we forget that even though we cannot get up and do something, that through prayer we can be transported to the front lines of the battle. Whether that's overseas for the spread of the gospel, whether that's the advancement of the gospel here in our church. Now, right now I'm in a cohort with 11 other pastors where we're going deeper in our personal prayer lives, and the desire coming out of that is that we would be able to lead the church into a deeper culture of prayer. And recently, I was introduced to these other guys in the cohort, and as we got to know each other, I was introduced to a pastor. His name is Jim. Uh, Jim is from Iowa, and he's been at his church for over 30 years, and just recently, at the beginning of the new year, he announced to his church that he would be retiring in two years. And so some of the younger guys in the cohort, one of the younger guys essentially said, "Uh, if you're retiring in two years, why are you here? Okay, and it's a reasonable question, you know, because all of us young guys and middle-aged guys are here uh, wanting to build something into the life of the church, but if you're retiring in two years, uh, why bother? His response was interesting. He said, what better gift could I give this church than using my last two years of ministry here to build a deeper culture of prayer as a foundation for the future? What better gift could I give? God still has me here, and I need to grow in prayer, and this church needs to grow in prayer. Now, those of you who would fall into the category of seasoned saints, you're still here. Like I said, you may not be able to do much physically, but you can do a lot spiritually. You can, like verse 19 with the Philippians, pray for the people of God. You can pray for the work of God. You can pray for the glory of God. You can still be fruitful and pray for the progress of the gospel in this generation at Southern Gables Church and generations yet to be born. Whether you stay or go, It's a win-win situation, but if you're still here, then that's because God has more work for you to do. Uh, Don't coast across the finish line. Uh, Don't do that with the spiritual legs that God has given you and the power of the Holy Spirit. Sprint, run, use the time that you have to move the kingdom forward by the power of prayer. 
I can't tell you how many people in my life who are seasoned saints who are praying for me and who are praying for the life of this church. Some of them are people who can't even get up and walk. But they're praying and they're having an impact on the kingdom. And we need to think in those terms. Pour our remaining days and strength and energy into the kingdom of God because that pays eternal dividends. And you'll grow closer to Christ. And I ask you, what could be better than that? That, my friends, is the definition of a win-win. And maybe you're one of those people like me who's kind of sandwiched in the middle of life where you say, you know, Lord, I want to be with you, but not quite yet. Okay, for me to live is Christ, and you know, I'm working on the to die is gain. Uh, If that's you, then keep serving the Lord and keep trusting that by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is preparing you for heaven. That day after day after day, week after week after week, he is preparing you and moving you toward that place in life where you can wholeheartedly say, for me to live is Christ, and yes, and amen, to die is gain. And so that you could say, hallelujah, if that's the outcome. But some of you this morning might be in a place where you cannot say with any integrity of heart, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, Neither pieces of those verse are part of your experience. If that's you, what do you need to do? Uh, Very simply, you need to put your trust in Jesus Christ. Your full faith and confidence in him to save you through no effort of your own. It's called grace. Salvation is by grace. It's the gift of God. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. But if you will look to Jesus and look to the cross and realize that he died for you on the cross, that he paid the penalty for your sins, that he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, and that all of his claims to be God are true and were true, If you will put your full faith and confidence in him to save you, he will save you by his power and he will give you everlasting life. And get this, it gets even better. He will give you his Holy Spirit. The spirit of the living God will come to live within you. And once the spirit of the living God comes to live within you, he will prepare you and bring you to this place in life where you can say, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Uh, I, I ask you, have you ever made that decision to trust in Christ? To wholly throw yourself upon him and his mercy. Lord, would you save me? Not like, hey, Lord, let's make a deal. No, Jesus is the deal. Or, God, we can work it out. No, the Bible says that all of our works are like filthy rags. We need to come to him, trusting in his grace. I ask you, have you made that decision? And then and only then would you be able to say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you would like to place your trust in Christ, I encourage you just to do that right now. Right now, just as you've been trusting in those chairs to hold your weight through no effort of your own, so too must you trust in Jesus to save you through no effort of your own. Uh, Salvation is the gift of God. It's a work of God, beginning, middle, and end. Uh, Put your trust in Christ. And friends, it's not so much any exact words that you would say, but it's more of the attitude and the posture of your heart. But if these words reflect the desire of your heart, make these words your words. Heavenly Father, I admit that I am weaker and more sinful than I ever believed. But through your Son, Jesus, I can be more loved and accepted than I ever dared hope. I thank you that Jesus lived the life that I never could have lived. He took the punishment that I deserved, and I believe that he was raised from the dead. Receive me now for his sake. I turn from my sins and I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. If that's your desire, make that prayer your prayer. And let us all remember that because of the wonderful work of Jesus, 
his body given for us on the cross. And because of his blood shed on the cross, because of his body and blood, we can say for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I ask you as we come to this table, do you realize how loved you are? How accepted you are in Christ? How powerful his spirit is working in your life to bring you to that point where you can say like Paul and like Dr. Andrew, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's interesting that the cup that represents the blood of Jesus. It also points to the new covenant. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood, right? And the sign of the new covenant is what? The indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. So as we come to the table today, we're reminded that he died for us, he gave his body, and he gave his blood, and through through faith in Jesus, the Spirit lives within us, and he's fitting us for heaven. What a wonderful thing. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this table of your grace. Thank you for the wonderful invitation you've set before us. That in Christ we are free to come and to remember all that Jesus has done. And we can rejoice in that and we can come forward and we can say, Lord, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. God, thank you for your mighty work of salvation, past, present, and future. And thank you for the joy and the confidence that you bring into our lives. And we thank you that life for us through faith in Jesus is a win-win. Thank you, Lord. Would you consecrate these elements now and spiritually nourish us for our good and for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.